Welcome, everyone. Uh, the name of this meeting is Legal Restrictions on Civil Society. Activists respond to the challenge. And we have until 2 o'clock, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this session. Um, excuse me while I read the introduction so we can get the, the meeting uh, going. Um, many of you are aware of the mounting global trend of crackdowns on civil society efforts by uh, efforts by authoritarian states to stifle dissent and otherwise silence pro-democracy and other advocates. Traditional means of repression, such as detention and imprisonment, are now replaced or accompanied by legal or quasi-legal obstacles to conducting rights work. The tools now used by author authoritarian states include burdensome registration, tax requirements, and financing restrictions, especially of organizations working with criminalized populations, restrictions on online expression, especially around HIV and sexuality, gender identity, sex work targeted as pornography, to speak about the groups that we work with. Hi. Uh, restrictions on freedom of assembly, including pride parades, as recently we've seen in Singapore, meetings of organizations representing key populations, charges of state subversion and terrorism, police abuse raids, targeting of individuals who speak out to the media, disappearance of lawyers, and the, the usual um, measures. These measures lead to what's referred to as a shrinking space for civil society to operate and exercise their human rights and promote democratic principles. <coughs> Harm reduction work has almost always been hampered by hostile environments and limited space. The criminalization of people who use drugs and the failure to use evidence-based approaches to reducing drug-related harms and preventing HIV and Hep C have caused untold damage to global public health, safety, and individual lives. Now this work is further endangered through the systematic violation of rights, these restrictive laws that, for example, are blocking funding and support. Today, we wanted to open up a space to come together and share experiences and ideas for mitigating the devastating effects of these measures being used against civil society. And we have a truly extraordinary group of people from around the world. Uh, we have people here from China, Hungary, Iran, the Philippines, Russia, Thailand. We have the international network of people who use drugs and each will describe uh, the situation that they've experienced recently or uh, um, that has uh, restricted their ability to operate and, and maybe share some recommendations and thoughts and just have a conversation uh, to move the issue forward since it's affecting so many of us. So thank you. And I am Karen Kaplan from Asia Catalyst, based in New York but working out of Bangkok and Beijing. We uh, build capacity of grassroots groups to advocate uh, for human rights and support uh, communities to build strong uh, organizations to do that from which to do that. And today, um, my first, I'm, I'm honored to uh, welcome our first speaker, also from Asia Catalyst, uh, Shen Ting Ting, who is a Director of Advocacy Research and Policy at Asia Catalyst, a prominent HIV and human rights advocate out of Beijing. Uh, she's worked with marginalized communities since her college days. In 2007, she co-founded the Corakata AIDS Law Center with Lee Dan, and in 2012, she was the deputy director of its pa parent organization, the Dung Jen Center for Human Rights Education Action, where she founded and managed an outreach program for sex workers in Beijing. Ting Ting received her MA in social welfare from Renmin University in China. Welcome, Ting Ting. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for so much for the introduction. I think that's really comprehensive. <laughs> yeah, I'm Ting Ting. I'm from Beijing, China. I've been um, working um, for uh, uh, HIV AIDS human rights since 2007. S um, and first I first started uh, working for a domestic NGO and now I'm working for Asia Catalyst, which is an uh, international NGO. So I have the opportunity to see how uh, the environment has been changed in the, in the past 10 years and how that affects the work of domestic domestic NGOs, but also international organizations in China. Um, um, in, I mean, um, in China, um, the NGO sector was um, developed, in, already developed in the past decade, actually, uh, thanks um, to the um, uh, funding and technical support of the international community. Um, and that time, uh, the government has been, uh, have a, Keep the 
close eye to um, the civil society, and that's why the NGO sector were able to flourish uh, in the past two decades. Um, and there were quite little um, uh, laws and regulations directed to regulate NGOs. So um, it's basically it's like a gray area. So we were able to um, do work in that um, space. Um, but in the past five, um, years, there's new development which um, that the government has been uh, working towards a more um, uh, uh, legalized um, uh, uh, model uh, um, to civil society, and this um, does have impact on our work. On one side, we have seen that um, for Chinese NGOs, it has becoming increasingly easier to register as an NGO with the government. Um, so, um, I f for example, our partners um, that I find most of our partners were able to uh, officially uh, register. Um, but um, for those organizations who are able to register, they uh, have to work really closely with the government, and which means that you have to um, do work according to the government plan. And for those so-called organizations that are working on so-called like sensitive issues, such as human rights or uh, legal rights uh, or LGBT rights, it's really, really difficult to register. Um, um, and at the same time, the government, you know, also because um, China has been um, uh, has enjoyed uh, the development of economic and that um, has seemed as the, uh, you know, uh, wealth enough to support um, its health, uh, it, its um, uh, uh, the, the work on HIV. So um, many international donors has been um, withdrawn from China. So the government plot means that they will, uh, uh, we, they will support um, the work of NGOs, so they did provide um, funding to um, to replace those international fundings. Um, but those fundings come with um, restrictions that um, they put NGOs only in a place that um, to do service. The government, um, uh, for example, we have this HIV fund, and for um, and just working on health reduction, sex workers, and NSM, each of them will have quotas, they have targets. Okay, you need to do uh, them, uh, how, many num the, 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 how many numbers of testing this year, how many numbers of follow-up this year, and we only fund that. And besides that, there's no funding for human rights advocacy. There's no funding for, uh, for legal education. There's no funding for discrimination. Um, groups working on that kind of work have to rely funding on uh, from uh, from abroad from uh, yeah, international fundings, um, but at the same time that the government also strengthen the control over international organizations and also international funding. Uh, last year um, we have this new law, um, um, uh, um, this new international uh, yeah, foreign NGO law. Basically, it's. Uh, it's a Chinese version of the of the laws in Russia um, that it requires any um, um, international organizations that want to do work in China and want to give uh, funding in China need to register uh, locally. Otherwise, it is there will there will be criminal charges uh, for those who violate the law. Um, so it 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 makes um, so it makes those who already were in China in the past 10 years, in the past like decades, became illegal because you have to register. But um, the registration, in order to register, there was uh, tons of uh, requirements, including that you need to find a government agent to be your sponsor. Um, and um, you need to be able to provide like uh, a lot of documents. Uh, and all these uh, manage I mean, the INGO's work uh, and the funding actually are all managed by the public security. Um, so, so, so that is becoming uh, very difficult for um, for many of the human rights work. Um, my uh, my friend Xi Pan, who is also from China, uh, 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 he will also talk about how that affects um, their work on uh, the heart reduction work. Uh, but I mean, 
she he engaged in um, her reduction um, about ten years ago. Uh, actually, were that time he were get he get a lot of support from the Open Society Foundation and and other um, uh, international like um, organizations. But that kind of support is no longer there because uh, because of the closing down of the space and including the funding. So that's the right. These days, there are very few heart reduction groups. I mean, there are still a, a number of them that uh, working really closely with government uh, to provide service. But it's 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 a totally different picture compared with ten years ago. So we are a little bit like heartbreaking. I mean, when we come here, we are the only two Chinese representative, and Shippen have been to like the previous conference, which they there, there was like bigger group. Um, so yeah, um, so this is the reality we face, and we have been trying to like find out and identify strategies that we can um, uh, we can continue the work in China. So I'm really looking forward to to also to discuss and hear from you. Thank you. <咳>我刚才就讲了一下 嗯，就是因为在这十年工作中，嗯，我发现，嗯，本身中国的这个国情和本身的法律对减低伤害工作还是有很多不利的因素，造成嗯我们这个工作嗯发展起来还是非常艰难的。但是这个工作对我们的收
，导致我在维护自己的权利的时候，嗯，他们说我袭警，就因为这个事情吧，就是因为管控系统造成了我自个儿还被拘留了二十二天，这个对我伤害非常大，嗯。所以说，所以说这个管控系统，嗯，如果长期的如果不进行推动、不进行倡导，它对整个人群和这个社群，嗯，非危害还是非常大的。但是，嗯，由于前些年的这个同伴的努力，实际上这个管控机制，政府还是很是重视的，决定推出一些三年以上的评评估机制。但是，就由于，嗯、呃，现在很多这个。倡导工作人员都已经大部分夭折了，这个社群的工作人员越来越少，所以这个工作就现在就停滞了。所以我来此次目的也是准备继续这个工作跟进下去。So I want to talk about two issues today. The first one is the dis discrimination against、um, people who use drugs in China and how that、uh, create barrier for、uh, harm reduction activists to to do their their work. Um, in China, we use、um, this、um, database、um, to register、um, drug users,、uh, and the database, database is managed by the Public Security、um, Department. Every drug users are、uh, in this database, and the information actually is linked with your ID card. So. Whenever you go, for example, you go to、uh, a hotel, you go to the train station, you take a flight,、um, you check your ID, and actually the um, 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 the, the the person can see、um, that you are a drug user, and the police will come and to uh, uh, and to ask for a unit test.、Um, this is、uh, one of the two. Tools that the government use to control the life of drug users, and it creates、uh, a huge negative impact to our、uh, life. Myself、um, is a is a victim of this system that、um, I have been、uh, stopped using drugs for over eight years. But not long before, just a couple months ago,、um, I was driving a car passing a a toy station, and I was stopped, and I was asked、um, to. Um, to do union test, and later I, I was、um, put in prison,、um, put in detention for twenty、uh, days. But uh, but um, according to the Chinese law, Chinese regulation,、um, for those、um, drug users who has been on、uh, abstain for over three years, they should be re removed from the database, and、um, they sh the police shouldn't come to them for union test anymore.、Um, Um, so the regula regulation, the the, the laws、um, there, but there's no implementation, and there's no one、um, is advocating for the implementation of the law.、Um, and I'm I'm I have been like working on reduction for so many years, and I contributed to、um, the community, but myself still suffer、um, such kind of treatment. How can the other、uh, uh, peers can involve in this work? <音>嗯，还有一个重要的就是关于美沙酮，嗯，呃，美沙酮这个现在最重要的问题是，就是不能够带带带回去服用。但是大量的这个，由于还有时间的问题，在国内，呃，十二家美沙酮都是只有九点到下午三点的营业时间，所以很多人员导致很多人员没法去工作，就导致了很多人员去会把药带回家。嗯，那么就产生了很多警察和这个美沙酮门诊合作。去逮这些把药偷回去的这个带回家的人员，就带造成大量的恐慌。所以说，现在我们想继续跟进这个，就是有一些成功案例，像图马斯在云南的这种把药带回家的这种倡导的工作。Um, the second issue is、um, access to to methadone. Well,、uh, in China, methadone is widely accessible. That、uh, we have over seven hundred、uh, methadone clinics,、um, but、uh, Even in Beijing, we have twelve clinics, but、um, the service actually is really restrictive. For example, on the open hours of the clinic, it's from nine to three. And Beijing is a huge city. And if you are you have a job, how can you go there and like from your workplace and then to the clinic and then go back to work? It's just impossible. And and also because that、uh, you can't take. Must don't out of the clinic. You have to drink、uh, at a site,、um, so you have to go every day.、Um, this is、uh, this is extremely inconvenient、um, for um, for、uh, people who want to have a normal life, um, and um, 
so actually many of um, our peers, we uh, try to like, for example, uh, keep the mastodon in our mouth and take it out of the, of the clinic because we we have to, I mean, sometimes we need to travel. How can we do with this? Um, but the police, they treat this as a legal, illegal um, um, behavior, and they wait outside of the clinic and just to detain our peers. Um, um, also, like uh, just a few days ago, um, um, I was with my daughter out of the clinic, and uh, the police just uh, just question me in front of my daughter. I feel really, really frustrated of this kind of um, uh, 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 like harassment by the um, by the by the police. I even want to um, stop like do doing this work. Um, so, um, but I I know it's really important for us to keep up the college and to uh, and to continue to ad to advocate. So I'm yeah. That's why I'm uh, I'm I'm here. Uh, I want to learn from you guys and to um, take good um, um, uh, lessons and experience back to China. Thank you. Yeah, sure. <coughs> yeah, hello everyone. I'm, I'm Peter Sharoshi and I, I come from Hungary, Budapest. Uh, it's a small country in Central Europe with 10 million people and uh, it's a member of the European Union. And uh, uh, as probably many of you know, Hungary, as many other Central and Eastern European countries, was ruled by uh, a, a communist system until 1990. So <coughs> actually the traditions of a free civil society or independent civil society are not so old in Hungary, maybe 20 years old. And uh, uh, actually we th we th there was never a, st a very strong uh, civil society in my region. Uh, in in when, when, when we had the change of the system from communism to, uh, to the Western time democracy, uh, one of the great uh, dissidents in Czech Republic, many, many of you probably know his name, Václav Havel, said that a totalitarian system can coexist with a, with, with a market society, it can coexist with parliamentarianism, but it cannot coexist with, it's a vibrant civil society, an independent civil society, so it's kind of very much the characteristic of a free society. And uh, now when we see these attacks against uh, civil society, all these governments claim that actually they are democratic and they, uh, they are committed to uh, uh, the values of uh, you know, Western democracies, keeping parliamentary and formalities, but at the same time they are, when they are repressing civil society, uh, they are repressing something which is very essential for, uh, for us to live in a free society. So in terms of uh, uh, harm reduction, <coughs> This issue is very important because most of the services, harm reduction services, are provided by NGOs in Hungary and many uh, other countries of the uh, region. And uh, in the beginning of the 21st century, we saw a quite uh, great improvement of, uh, of coverage in harm reduction services. New needle and syringe programs were created. Uh, uh, which could reach out uh, one of the most uh, uh, marginalized groups of uh, injecting drug users in the who are concentrating in Budapest. Uh, uh, most of these people actually belong to a Roma minority, so uh, the stigma and discrimination against them is it, it's based also rooted in, in some uh, race racial prejudices. And, uh <coughs> and uh, there, there were two uh, large needle and syringe programs in Budapest uh, which actually provided more than 50% of all clean needles in Budapest, so that they were like the simple largest uh, harm reduction programs in Budapest. And uh, uh, after 2010, there was a change of government in Hungary. Uh, a conservative right-wing government took power uh, of with uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who is uh, now a populist uh, leader. and. Uh, and this government actually cut back funding for uh, harm reduction programs. It turned uh, Hungarian drug policy to another direction. They adopted a new drug strategy in 2013, which uh, aims to create a drug-free Hungary by 2020, which is a very ambitious and uh, very uh, stupid uh, target, if you ask me. And, uh <coughs> and of course, uh, this ideological turn was uh, uh, also uh, uh it, 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 there was also some political attacks on, on, on these programs, especially in the local level in Budapest. And uh, uh, s one of the local mayors uh, uh, 
used actually needle exchange programs, scapegoated needle exchange programs, and scapegoated people uh, used drugs to gain political power and popularity. And he organized demonstrations against these programs, the needle exchange programs, uh, with you know misled local people. He claimed that needle exchange programs are actually responsible for attracting drug users to uh, to his district, and uh, they are responsible for spreading uh, uh, drug litter on the streets and. Uh, uh he just, you know, uh, uh, cu cut back their funding, and uh, he just made it impossible for them to continue their work. So, uh, in in 2014, both uh, this the two two largest needle and syringe programs had to close down in in Budapest, and uh, that means that now uh, thousands of uh, um, very marginalized Roma uh, injecting drug users are uh, without any uh, help and without any support. And the attack against civil society does not end here. Now. Uh, just like in China, we also import the good old Russian uh, methods to repress civil society. We, uh, our, our government also introduced a law this year. Uh, that law uh, uh, requires us, NGOs, who receive uh, funding from foreign donors or in international donors to register as uh, uh, NGOs funded by foreign uh, countries. So it's like a foreign agent uh, law and uh, we have to register uh, uh, online we have to uh, fill out sheets when we receive any kind of funding from uh, uh, international sources and uh, each and every uh, publication you have we have to uh, put a sign that we are foreign agents and um, right now actually the european union started an investigation or the, the european parliament uh, decided to make an investigation uh, against hungary but of course it could take years uh, and prob probably also heard about uh, the issue of the Central European Uni University. So now all these two issues are going uh, 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 together, and the EU is going investigations. But Hungary is a very good example that it's not enough to be part of the, let's say, the democratic club of countries like the European Union. But uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's 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 the question of uh, of 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 the. Who, who has the political power in your own country and uh, whether civil society can mobilize people. Uh, do I still have two minutes or should I? F one minute, okay. Because I, I just wanted to sh point out a few like characteristics of, of, of populist uh, uh, populism in Hungary. And one is that, the, that, that, that this concept of the people, because that's why they call it populism, populist, that they their concept of people is, is not self-organizing citizens, but atomized subjects who have like a privileged relationship with, with their leader. So that's why they, they think that, you know, all NGOs uh, actually want to destroy this privileged relationship between the state and between the citizen. And then there is like an anti-intellectualism as a characteristic of, of populism. Like they are distrusting science, they are distrusting data, they don't like experts, uh, and actually they amplify this uh, opposition in simple people to things they don't understand because they are very complex problems. But that means that we as NGOs, we should speak to the people and we should make them understand things. Uh, we should much make much more effort on that. And then uh, they, uh, uh, they, they also uh, say that political space is an exclusive space only for elected political officials, and NGOs has no place to, uh, to deal with politics and to you know, influence uh, policy making. Then they always create conflicts. I think that, you know, they, th that that's, that's how they uh, gain power, that they continuously creating conflicts with an imagined or a real enemy. And uh, uh, there, like, th it's, it's like really for them, when, when, when you are taking the conflict and you are fighting them, sometimes that's what they want. So that's, that's also, you know, an issue we have to keep in mind. Thank you very much. Hi, it's great to be here. I'm Mohamed Karamuzian. I work with the WHO Collaborating Center for HIV Surveillance in the Middle East and North African context. Uh, I also work with the BC Center for Excellence for HIV AIDS in British Columbia, Canada. I think I would, uh, uh, it's, it's sad to hear your stories. I, I think Iran's story is, uh, compared to those, is more of a success story in how you could uh, key harm reduction running in a conservative, uh, faith-based government. And uh, I don't want to call it an Islamic setting, because like, 
it would be uh, overgeneralizing, but I would leave it to conservative. So I think uh, just a little bit of a uh, quick background on how everything started in Iran. Uh, I think harm reduction around uh, started around addressing the issue of uh, epidemics of HIV in prisons across the country. And then uh, after that, it was built around uh, reducing harm among people who use, uh, who inject drugs. And so it was still because it, at back in the days, 96% of the population who were uh, living with HIV or getting HIV was through injection drug use. But uh, the modes of transmission are changing like every other uh, place around the world. Uh, so uh, they started with uh, addressing uh, harm reduction inside prisons and then taking it to uh, scaling it up to, to address the issue among people who inject drugs across the country. Uh, but harm reduction, when speaking of uh, harm reduction services for people who inject drugs, it's around 15 years old. And uh, speaking of other key populations, uh, like sex workers, it's less than 10 years old. But uh, mm, I think we were supposed to talk about some of the challenges. Sm uh, speaking about, uh, um, uh, I think it's really, when it's really important to put your success in context. Uh, in the case of Iran, we were, we were talking about a conservative setting, a country that has gone through a revolution 30 some years ago, has been under constant economic sanctions. So providing funding for uh, such services uh, is always a challenge. It remains to be a challenge, and it has always been a challenge. So I think I, I would give them the credit for taking the initiative and being an example for the region. Uh, but uh, I think about I could uh, I could think of uh, we can discuss about like we have had similar issues. Both of the examples you've. Uh, you talked about, we can talk about it through the discussion, but I think one of the ways that I could uh, classify this as like a relatively uh, working and functioning system when it comes to harm reduction where we have like a free needle in exchange uh, services, we have uh, all the harm reduction services inside prison settings both for men and women, uh, we have uh, women only clinics, uh, centers for vulnerable women, is about working with the public and the government at the same, like working next to them and trying to see that in a conservative setting the government might not be very willing to uh, show the ugly face of the, uh, the situation, which is probably the case in all conservative settings. So we've tried to be very diplomatic in how uh, we released our data, we published data, so, and then we've tried to build uh, collaborations with the ministries of health and uh, with the NGOs. Uh, so we designed the surveillance for ministries of health, so we get to add what the research parties want to know into the surveillance system, which might not be necessarily research oriented. And then we go to them with topics that might be interesting for them and get it, get them involved in research. It's harder to publish, but it's not, we've, I think we've made that clear for them that it's not for the sake of the publication. So we've just recently been able to build a collaboration with the Ministries of Health and the Social Welfare Organization who are in charge of running the harm reduction inside the country that we have uh, a list of topics that might be interesting in, in order to improve the system. You tell us, you prioritize it for us. Which one do you want us to address first? And then I think that's been a fairly uh, functional system because uh, it looks like it's working and then we get their feedback if they're interested in uh, uh, having their name on pieces there is no barrier to that. If they're not interested, there is no, we're very flexible. I think working with them has been uh, uh, the key and making it clear for them that we're not going to uh, use this against you and this is for the sake of 
the people. And then on the other hand, when you're in a conservative setting, and again, a faith-based uh, setting, addressing the concerns of the public is another key issue. And I think the harm reduction bodies, including NGOs, have been very uh, successful in changing the lexicon around uh, what harm reduction is. For example, when we wanted to start uh, services for sex workers, the word sex is like taboo in the conservative settings, like especially Islamic settings. This is like a don't say, don't say it type of thing. So uh, with sex workers, uh, I think that especially NGOs and NGOs who work with the ministries of health and researchers, they were uh, successful in changing the lexicon and calling it vulnerable women, which is an Islamic concept, which means uh, literally women who need help. So the, now we're building on that aspect of Islam that says you need to help people who need help. So I think working with the language, and then so there are like uh, over 40 centers who provide services for sex workers, but they're called centers for vulnerable women. And no, but like it doesn't uh, flag anyone. Uh, so I, th I think, uh, uh, the, speaking of challenges, what I could say is that in Iran, harm reduction is conducted through parallel bodies. Uh, and these bodies are, some of them are like related to the government, some of them are related to NGOs. But again, I think the same thing with like a cis system to Hungary. It's hard to be very independent in a conservative setting. So like you have to be semi-independent if you want to function. Uh, so like we really don't have a lot of, we do have a few, I would say, very independent NGOs, but they're really having a hard time with finding, uh, finding and securing funding. So most of the NGO work is done through a collaboration and then the ministries of health especially try to support them through like a lot of empowerment uh, programs. Uh, but uh, right now, like I can speak to like something very recent is that uh, a, a body, a, like one part of this, uh, like a, there are three parallel bodies involved in harm reduction. One of them is in enforcement law. People who have the most power and mo like the most funding so like they don't necessarily collab like Ministry of, Ministry of Health is uh, leading a more harm reduction based, evidence based approach while they do not necessarily uh, believe in that or they do not necessarily follow that. I think that's, that, that's been a very ongoing challenge. But what we're trying to do is like to reach out to them ourselves. Like we uh, go through a lot of meetings with them and try to address their concerns and hopefully uh, keep this running. I think like shutting down harm reduction is uh, way worse than having a semi-working, <laughs> relatively working one. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mohammed. And our next speaker is Ines from the Philippines, uh, if you could introduce yourself. Okay, hi, I'm Inez from Novox. Um, Novox is, is, a, is an organization that we put together basically because um, people who are using drugs or involved with drugs are just not treated right. It's as simple as that. And a lot of it comes from uh, the misinformation that has led also to associate people. Sorry. <laughs> to associate people involved with drugs uh, with automatically with crime. Um, the war on drugs is not new, actually. It's been around for a long time. And in fact, our 2002 law uh, came about to overhaul the 1972 law because they, they thought it wasn't harsh enough. So o it's always been there, except that a lot of the people who were affected were those in the lower income communities that people don't really get to hear about. So, um, because people don't talk about it, this is what the current administration had capitalized on, on the misinformation, and um, which has led to a lot of actions that has been taken against people who use drugs. So the law has been there. Uh, drug use is uh, considered a crime. So is possession. Uh, and in fact, possession, when with your two other people can lead to life imprisonment, for example. Um, 
and that has kept people away from seeking help and services. And on top of that, um, now where they have tried to push, um, how would I say it? Because they're capitalizing on this fear and just feeding into it and just getting people to be scared, more scared of people drug use. This is supplemented by more and more um, uh, laws, executive orders that have been put into place. For example, uh, you have the police circular that has led to the police going to homes in lower income communities and forcing people to surrender, uh, which they have claimed is considered a success. Um, and then so there have been board regulations issued by the policy agency, for example, there's supposed to be guidelines on how to handle people who have um, quote unquote volunteered or surrendered. But these regulations is are really uh, a lot of a lot of the things that they've started to put into place are are things that uh, try to elicit more information. So it's more like intelligence stuff to elicit information. For example, if you surrender, you waive your um, you waive your rights, and you say basically that you agree to subject yourself to uh, drug testing and and uh, to. Uh, to need to go to rehabilitation and you surrender your phone, you have to give the names and if you have photos of people who you have been associating with in regards to drug use. Um, and then now they're pushing to support the administration's campaign. Drug testing has always been in the law, but now they're reviving it. So now there's drug testing in, they're gonna uh, resume drug testing in schools. And in some, they're saying they're gonna drug test all students, for example, instead of random drug testing. Uh, you have in the workplace where they have, for example, in a city, they, drug, they did drug testing for all um, the employees. So it's, it's, um, so it's just kinda, it's not, I, I was thinking when you said the laws restricting us, it's not so much like directly uh, restricting us, for example, but it's just that creating the environment that makes it a little bit uh, more difficult. And I, we feel sometimes it's like an attack on all sides because they're doing it in different aspects. So it's different, to, it's difficult to address all these different things. Um, um, what else? Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, I think, um, oh, okay, okay. So I guess uh, at the same time, um, because I was mentioning, we hear about all the terrible things that are happening, but I think one of the things that is kind of missing and we want to, to share is that the situation now has actually created this space where um, we uh, created a space where we're able to come in and introduce a an alternative source because people now uh, the killings have become closer to home for a lot of people and they're saying no this is not the way to go but what do we do so there is now space for providing the if not this what then so in fact we have uh, communities local barangays who have sought our help to develop responses in their communities that won't mean killing but in providing the kinds of services and in a more engaging and humane manner um, the difficulty, the only, the, one of the challenges we see there is that people who have surrendered are now kind of targeted and identified. So that's a difficult thing that we kind of have to strategize, strategize about in doing, uh, in developing responses in the community. Meaning where before maybe it was the police, they knew who their, <laughs> their uh, kind of enemy was. Um, now they don't know who it's going to be because now people, like some of them were sharing, people who have not surrendered now kind of look at them as people who are sharing information. So now they don't know. So that's the thing. And there are also people who have been forced to report, show up for the supposedly programs of barangays, but who end up getting killed anyway, because now they are identified. So these are the things that we need to, um, to work with. Uh, but at the same time, when I spoke about um, opportunities, uh, we have also learned, for example, when we speak of the government, it's not just one person. There are actually people in government who are seeking to learn more and to know more about better responses. So I think, as I mentioned before, it's not just about saying, you know, you're doing what's wrong, but it's also providing what we can do 
and what's possible. So we also try to engage with people in government agencies, uh, with the policy agency. We are also doing work with uh, Department of Health, for example, in introducing and coming up with papers with regards to harm reduction. Um, also, um, I think uh, one of the things also that we realize it's about developing communications. Uh, and when you say communication, it's understanding, I think this was brought up during the plenary earlier, it's also understanding where the people are coming from when they are supporting the current administration's responses. It's coming from a need. And to tell them simply that, it's, that they're wrong is not gonna answer their need. So we need to understand that. So we're also creating the space for the people who may not necessarily be sharing our views to see where they're coming from. And to also reinforce what positive uh, and and um, uh, things that they are doing, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, wonderful. Thank you, Ines, um, for being a really restrictive environment, but heartening to hear that you're seeing opportunities. Um, Mikael, welcome, and please introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Mikhail Golichenko from Russia. Uh, working for Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network, but uh, providing uh, technical assistance for Russia and Russian-speaking countries. Uh, this talk is about Russia. Uh, as uh, many of you heard, Russia is sort of first country to introduce this foreign agent law, uh, which is not true. The first, uh, Ethiopia beat us. Beat us big time. They were first. And then Russia. Uh, but Russia is sort of on the tip of uh, uh, everybody's tongue because uh, it went to, to news and uh, I'm not going to uh, lower it down. It's really bad. Right? Um, I, I want to emphasize, uh, put emphasis on three points. Uh, point number one, uh, from where it started and where we are now. It started all from uh, the uh, uh, election watchdog called Golas. Back in 2012, uh, everybody, uh, including human rights defenders and human rights lawyers, uh, I remember, used to say that, oh, it's only about elections, and that's understandable, because uh, elections watchdogs, they are human rights defenders, but in a way, they are part of uh, political uh, opposition, and therefore, when the government is trying to strike back uh, to uh, get uh, off the hook of foreign money to uh, infuse the democracy in our countries, that's probably right, right? They were wrong big time because when the government starts chewing up somebody next to you, very soon it'll start chewing up you. That's exactly what happened. Four years later, we've got 150 NGOs who went into the uh, foreign agents uh, uh, roster. Most of them are human rights defenders, and not only the mainstream human rights defenders, but, sh but such uh, human rights defenders as uh, those who protect the environment, uh, those who protect uh, wildlife. Uh, and now, uh, from the year 2016, by now we have eight uh, harm reduction service providers, uh, people working for MSM communities, uh, protecting them from HIV, uh, three of which entered the uh, foreign agent roster voluntarily after they received uh, uh, the uh, offer uh, by the Ministry of Justice. Basically, uh, it was a threat that uh, if you don't do it voluntarily, we'll get you uh, there anyway, and you are going to get huge fine. So now we have eight uh, out of 150, those which work for harm reduction. But it's not uh, that uh, extremely hard to be on this roster and continue working. The main part uh, of uh, uh, hardship behind the foreign agent law is that uh, getting funding uh, from Russian sources is uh, almost impossible. Although n there is no clear restrictions except one uh, uh, law, another law provides opportunity for the foreign agents to apply for foreign uh, funding. But uh, I think it's, it was a very uh, important part of the decision to start going after HIV service providers to get them into the roster because of the uh, demand for government money started growing up after foreign donors decided to withdraw from Russia. Uh, because Russia is the high income country, which is true. Money is there. Money has never been available for public. 
uh, money is there for 1% uh, of the society, less than 1%, those who are holding the power. And I think it was quite uh, naive for foreign donors to treat the country, keep a blind eye, and think that, okay, it's a high-income country, and therefore we are withdrawing. That was a huge, huge, very important one uh, mortal blow. Uh, of uh, foreign investors, foreign donors, to the whole civil society of Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia, and now, as we see, other countries. It's, it's a very important mistake, and we have to keep it in mind. Uh, the, the, and it's a lesson to learn by foreign donors not to do this. And I remember the excuse was, we don't want to put people at risk because now, because of foreign funding, they are becoming foreign agents, and uh, they are at risk. We don't want to expose them, therefore we are withdrawing. Nobody asked uh, people, right? Nobody asked people, do you want to get money? Do you want to continue working regardless of all this? Nobody asked. They just decided we want to withdraw because it's sort of becoming dangerous. Without even thinking that those who work for harm reduction, those who work for human rights, they do this not because of money. They'll continue working uh, uh, and, and defend their rights just because it's their life position, right? So. Money there, money with, uh, not there, they still continue working. Without money, without foreign support, without foreign support, not only financial, but other support, right? They would be just even more exposed, right? So that's a very important, uh, uh, I think, lesson to learn. Then what do we do next? Uh, I'm sure that uh, the situation is going to become worse. Uh, because now we have uh, war rhetoric uh, uh, coming into this uh, whole uh, implementation of uh, the foreign agent law because now we have the war with Ukraine. And uh, if, you, if you see the judgments and the decisions of the Ministry of Justice uh, against the uh, foreign agents, uh, the war rhetoric is there, like some very key words which were only applicable to the war affairs, now they are there. So the idea is that these people are foreign agents and they are working against the Russian public by promoting something which is very bad. It's a threat, such as needle and syringe, such as uh, drug use, and so on. Therefore, we treat them appropriately and call them foreign agents and cut the funding and so on and so forth. So it'll be worse uh, with the pace of time because this war is not going to end tomorrow. And the waves from Russia are going to spread all over Eastern Europe and other countries in Europe which are not that strong in their democratic uh, uh, systems. Hungary is first, but it's not going to be lost. Uh, we, we actually see th what is going on in the US, the strongest democracy, and yet how quick it just flipped, right? So it's going to be the same. My point is that if we want to stop something, we have to stop it at its source, and source is Russia. So if we are to work uh, on issue globally, we have to uh, continue working in, in, in those old countries. And then the next uh, very short uh, but important point is that in the very beginning, I guess, of uh, harm reduction, HIV services, all these activities, there was always an idea that we have to manage this large project, important uh, uh, projects, but we have to manage them uh, trying to uh, make the system similar to how the business entities operate. Indicators, uh, different outcomes, and so on. It worked for some time, but the uh, most important set of indicators were always about cooperation with the government. Okay, How many times you attended this meeting, how many of your people went there, how many uh, uh, bridges we built in order to uh, start cooperating between uh, uh, key populations and the government. And this created, on the one hand, this uh, wide perception that as soon as the government is attacking NGOs, and NGOs knew that, uh, that means these NGOs are also not going to get the foreign funding because they wouldn't be able to fulfill these very indicators, very important, because how would they cooperate, right? This one thing. And so that sort of domesticated them uh, when they talk to the government and prevented them to strike back, one. At, and it's the whole culture in such country as Russia that NGOs, many NGOs, many NGO leaders didn't want to act and fight back. As soon as I started hearing about their uh, uh, peers being uh, in the foreign agent law, they thought, okay, okay, that's probably, they are bad, but we are not going to be affected. And it's still like this. People continue talking. Only four out of eight 
decided to strike back, and they were successful in a way. Uh, one is still doing absolutely nothing, got one fine after another, huge fine already, and instead of fighting back in the court, he is asking for money. Uh, right? It's, I understand him, but I know what is behind this attitude. I think it's very wrong. And then the very last, what to do next? In order to break this whole attitude and actually environment which was created unexpectedly and absolutely unintentionally, right? I think we all have to think about very flexible ways to continue this work regardless the worsening environment. Possible ways could be, one, uh, stop funding NGOs start funding people and activities. And there are tons of ways, because we are having video record, I don't want to uh, say that, but there are many, many ways how we can do this. Forget about these NGOs. It's not necessary that you have to give money to NGOs, okay? There are many ways. And then, uh, uh, imp most important, I think, is that NGOs, what is NGO? It's nothing. It's just, it's just sound. People, right? People are behind NGOs. How many NGOs are broken now, but we still have people who used to be activists attached to this NGO? They remain. They remain working without money. They are still there. Let's continue supporting them rather than thinking about that NGO. So the very final point is everything is not that bad <laughs> if we are thinking with uh, appropriate flexibility, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Mikhail. And next, we're on to my dear friend, Pitam Supatra from Thailand. And I'll just do a time check. Uh, it's 1.40. Uh, we have two or three more speakers, and it'd be great to have a five-minute thing. So please okay. Thank you, Karin. Uh, I think the situation in Thailand seems like a like uh, in Russia, in China, and many countries that is you present already, but I I would like to to uh, focus on the overall work environment working for CSO in Thailand, because uh, you know the civil society organization. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, a senior human rights uh, lawyer, he said that the situation. In Thailand now, it look like a uh, Thailand uh, retreat more than 85 years ago, <laughs> before before the <laughs> the the change of rule uh, from absolute monarchy to democracy, something like that. So that you that you know that is a uh, very serious is on. Uh, the monarchy, <laughs> so I, I cannot sit, say it anymore because maybe I can go back home. So, uh, since the National Council for Peace and Order, it is the name of NCPO, they take uh, the took power in the COP in May 2014, uh, and then they set up the National Legislative Assembly or NLA, ne? Uh, the NLA take a role as the House of Representatives and the Senate. In two years ago, they passed the law uh, about 179. So many law, <laughs> and change many things in Thailand also. And also in the interim, uh, interim constitution, Section 44, <laughs> this is very, very famous in Thailand because when the, the, the Prime Minister t uh, take the power of sec uh, Section 44, it means everything absolutely like that. So uh, the, ex the Section 44 provides unlimited power for the leader of the NCPO. And uh, I think the 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 big issue that is uh, when the when the prime minister used the section 44 is mean the big change is coming just like uh, you know uh, the freedom and absolute expression in Thailand is also uh, limited the NCPO has banned political gathering of more than five persons. 
uh, since the COP, at least 80 persons have been arrested and sent to the military court for organizing or taking part in peaceful public gathering. Uh, and also, you know, uh, people uh, has been arrested and charged with sedition for criticizing military rule and violation the military government ban on public assembly. Uh, just like the people, he is a work uh, a factory worker. He was arrested and charged with sending uh, sedition and computer crime for sharing Facebook infographic uh, to share the corruption by the leader of the NCPO. So uh, that is happened in Thailand. And the military unit in Bangkok and other provinces forced to cancellation of more than 60 political events. Uh, seminar and also academy panel on political and human rights issue. So that means people who have tried to set up the seminar or the panel on uh, political issue cannot do in Thailand. <laughs> so, like you know, the criticizing the monarchy is serious criminal offense in Thailand now. And I think uh, for the human rights defender, now we have a friend, she is a lawyer, a human rights lawyer, and she was uh, arrested by the NCPO, the military, because she helped, she is the legal assistant with the, the student who tried to make a protest on the street so that she uh, she arrest and then take 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 her to the military court so that is mean the lawyer is not safe also it not all, only people and for harm reduction i think my friend from thailand kun noi kun cookie maybe can share for uh, Uh, the ONCB Office of Narcotic Control Board uh, they announced the the harm reduction policy uh, in February this year. Uh, the the policy that implement in thirty seven province and the duration of implement is February. Uh, this year to September uh, 2019, but uh, the policy look like good, but for implementation, it have a lot of limited for practice, just as when they talk about the naroxone service. But uh, the, 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 the question is who will be paid for the naroxone, and who, be because the naroxone is the, the the medicine it should be used by the the medical uh, so uh, and the other the other is uh, with uh, I, th I think important is Thailand on the process to be uh, make a draft of drug code more than two years ago uh, and now the drug, uh, the draft of drug code is uh, under the judicial uh, council to consider and uh, I think and hope that it will be coming in soon. I have to apologize to every speaker that we don't have time and I have to cut people off. Thank you, Peter.